our first speaker of the day, Mark Huxman, Professor Social Professor School of Applied Sciences in Edinburgh Napier University. Mark is going to talk to us about nature-based solutions. And um, we've got a name for your session, The Secrets of Mangroves at S Carbon 6. Welcome, Mark. Thank you. Um, and it's lovely to be with you and with all of you today. So um, I've got 20 minutes and what I hope I can do is introduce you to um, uh, quite a small but very remarkable ecosystem, um, which is mangrove forests. Um, and so I'm going to give a very quick introduction to mangrove forests and then I'm going to talk about the way in which uh, myself and colleagues have been using these remarkable forests um, to help tackle the problem of climate change, but also to bring resources uh, for the people who live in and around those forests. So I'm just sharing the screen and I'm hoping if anything doesn't work, um, I'll, I'll hear from our facilitators. So I'm hoping you can see uh, the screen there. And what you're looking at actually is a, an arboreal crab. So mangrove forests are really remarkable ecosystems, especially from the perspective of the northern European um, ecologists like myself, because they're forests, they're proper forests um, with sometimes very large trees up to 50 meters tall, um, but they grow in marine ecosystems, they grow in the sea. And what that means is that they combine those things that you expect from a forest, uh, timber, carbon, foliage, all the functions that a forest produces, they combine that with uh, the functions of a marine ecosystem. Um, and that includes marine fauna like this crab, which literally climbs up the trees and, and feeds on the, on the leaves in the trees. So I'm going to start with the big picture here. The big picture is climate change. Change, um, or particularly anthropogenic climate change, climate change that's driven by human beings and human emissions. Uh, and the main uh, emission, as represented by this diagram, comes from industry, from the burning of fossil fuels in industry. Um, but around 15% of anthropogenic emissions also come from burning and destroying natural ecosystems. And in total, that comes to 11 and a half billion tons of carbon that human beings are responsible for putting into the atmosphere every year. So just uh, that's a big number and it's hard for us. Most human beings struggle to understand uh, what large and small numbers mean. Uh, one way of thinking about that number is to think of that large ship that some of you may have seen that was blocking the Panama Canal uh, last year. Um, that 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 single container ship was so large that it blocked the whole of the Panama Canal. If you imagine a ship like that and then put a continuous line of those ships uh, nose to tail around the globe for 42 times, 42 times around the globe, those ships would be able, able to store uh, roughly that equivalent of um, 11 billion tons of carbon in, in volume. So it's a very large amount. We're putting a large amount of carbon into the into the atmosphere. Um, so what happens to that carbon? Well, one of the uh, really remarkable findings of climate science over the last 40 years, I suppose, is that um, much of that carbon, around 50 percent of it, does not stay in the atmosphere. It is absorbed by natural ecosystems. Um, three gigatons, three billion tons of it is absorbed in the land, that's mostly by forests, but some other ecosystems on land. And the rest, slightly under half of that 50%, is absorbed into the oceans. So um, when we talk about nature-based solutions, um, we already have an, a very significant nature-based contribution uh, to climate change and to mitigating the effects of climate change. And that is that natural ecosystems at the moment are absorbing around half of all the carbon emissions um, that human beings release. So without that function, without that natural contribution, climate change would be 
massively worse, more than twice uh, worse than it is at the moment. And a major discussion for climate scientists is what happens when those ecosystems start to fail to take in that, that, that carbon. Uh, climate change will accelerate very fast in that case. Um, this is a slightly technical slide, but I'm going now to um, the report by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change that came out in 2018. And what that report did was to say, how can we achieve the public goal, which has been agreed to by all the signatories to the Paris Agreement in 2015, of limiting or at least attempting to limit temperature rises to 1.5 degrees on average. Um, can we, how do we achieve that goal? Is it even possible? And this report um, was a very serious attempt at answering that question. Um, there are four scenarios in that report in which uh, the IPCC uh, describes how that might be possible. And the scenarios involve increasing, uh, increasingly risky assumptions about what we can do um, as a global society to achieve that. So by the time we get to scenario number four, uh, we're involving lots of technology which has not been invented yet. So it's a very, very risky scenario. So we're better off sticking with the, the early scenarios. Um, and I'm looking at particularly uh, P1, picture one, scenario one. And scenario one just assumes that um, we do two things. So what's happening here is a very, very rapid reduction in the amount of carbon dioxide that human beings are putting into the, into the atmosphere, um, a reduction of about 7% per year, combined with these brown areas. And these brown areas show natural carbon sinks, particularly forests. So at the moment, we're we're losing natural carbon sinks. And in this scenario, you can see that eventually we, we increase natural carbon sinks. By about 2050, they're, they're actually growing in size. So this scenario assumes by about mid-century that we've got around 9 or 9.5 million square kilometers of more, more forest than we have on the planet at the moment, which will suck down additional carbon dioxide. So this is, this is going to be a difficult task, as you can see, but it is technically feasible. Uh, what I want to talk about now is a particular type of forest, which is mangroves. And as I say, they're a marine uh, system. They're only 16,000 square kilometers um, on the planet. So it's quite a small area of forest compared to most forests. But what I say is also relevant to other marine ecosystems, particularly seagrass. In this picture, you can see here are the mangrove forests. And, and these plants down in the water are called seagrass. And they also are capable of trapping uh, carbon. So they're another important carbon sink. So that's the total area of uh, mangrove forest as a proportion of all the forests in the tropics. You can see it's less than 1% um, of all of, of all of our forests, tropical forests, are mangrove forests. But if we look at the carbon burial, this is carbon buried below the ground in forests, you can see that the mangroves are responsible for 30% um, of that. So despite their very small size compared to tropical rainforests or boreal forests, despite their small size, they, they're very, very powerful carbon sinks. And a key part of that is their ability to bury carbon um, in the soil, in the sediment in which they grow. Um, just briefly, uh, comments on how they managed to do this. Um, here's a mangrove forest, uh, a mangrove tree, and uh, you can see it's characterized by these very striking aerial roots. So mangroves have roots that emerge from their trunks above the ground, and that helps stabilize them, and it also helps capture oxygen. Now, if the sea level rises, um, those roots are in danger of being drowned. Um, the, the mangrove uh, cannot survive if the water is very deep. However, um, because the sea has gone up, it brings in more sediments, more particles, more carbon. Um, and this stimulates the growth of additional roots in the trees. And these additional roots then trap more sediment. And so we have a process like this, which involves um, elevation of the forest surface. So this is called surface elevation. 
And what it means quite remarkably is that these mangrove forests are able to move, increase um, in height, the surface of the forest floor as the sea level goes up. So if you're living behind a mangrove forest and that mangrove forest is healthy, then it will protect your coastline by trapping additional particles like this. Um, and inside of those particles, inside of that soil or sediment, um, is large amounts of carbon. So this is how the trees capture carbon and bury it in the soil. So one of the best things you can have if you're on a co tropical coastline with rapidly um, increasing sea level, if you're in danger of storms or in danger of coastal erosion, is a healthy mangrove forest in front of your shoreline. So here's a, here's a real forest um, and you can see here the kind of carbon that we're talking about. All of this very dark material here is a complicated mixture of um, organic material. Some of it's coming from the forest itself, some of it is washing in from the sea and some of it is coming down the river and being trapped by these trees. And when we look at the total carbon budget, the amount of carbon in the forest as a whole, um, we find about 10% of it is in the trees up at the top, um, above the above ground carbon, the, the branches uh, and the trunks of the trees. But 90% of it is buried deep in this very carbon rich soil. So um, what does this mean or what might this mean for uh, the lives of people close to mangroves? Well, one thing that we've been working on for the past 15 years now actually is to use some of this science around carbon and climate change um, to bring conservation benefits for local people. And uh, most of this work has been done in southern Kenya. Uh, so down in a place called Ghazi Bay, which is uh, close to the, um, the Tanzanian border in Kenya. Um, and there's another project which is right on that border actually at Vanga. So these are quite large mangrove forests. Um, the people in this area rely very heavily on these ecosystems, and that tends to be true for mangroves throughout the world. So they're very, very useful ecosystems. They provide fisheries and crabs for local people. They provide timber, of course. They protect the co coastline, as I've just said. They help to filter water as they go through the mangroves. So the mangroves take in nutrients and pollution. They trap pollution. Um, and they support the, the livelihoods of the people who live close to these areas. But here in Kenya, as in many countries, um, the forests have been struggling over the last 30 years. So uh, there, there are more people there and there are more demands on the wood and it's become much more difficult to maintain these forests sustainable, sustainably. So the projects that we're involved in uh, plant new forests, so we plant uh, around 4,000 trees every year. Um, but from a carbon perspective, this kind of forest planting um, is only brings limited benefits and it brings benefit, they're quite slow because of course trees take uh, 20 to 30 years to, to mature. So um, although forest restoration and planting is very important, it's only a small part of uh, the carbon budget of these kinds of projects. Um, so forest restoration is the main part. And what we're able to do, if we can show scientifically that we're both restoring the forests and that we're preventing the loss of, of existing forests, um, we're able to turn that carbon that we're able to demonstrate that we're saving, um, uh, we're able to turn that into carbon credits. So here's an example of a carbon credit um, this is a certificate for a thousand tons of carbon dioxide. And this was sold to uh, Earthwatch Institute. They're a charity that supported some of this work. And they were interested in offsetting the carbon pollution that the volunteers who uh, are recruited by this char charity contribute to. They fly around the world. And whenever we do that, if you fly, you'll have a carbon uh, footprint. And um, you know, I think we need to do something about that carbon footprint. So you can choose not to fly, but if you choose to fly, and there are lots of good reasons to, to, to go to places, then offsetting is one approach 
that we can take to try and mitigate or reduce that impact. So that's the idea of carbon offsetting on the so-called voluntary carbon market. And there are now many companies and individuals who are interested in buying these credits from us. Um, for, for the people who live locally, they own these projects. The forest does not belong to, to me or to, or, or, or to any outsiders. It belongs to, in fact, it belongs to the Kenyan government. Um, but the Kenyan government allows local people to manage it. And um, the, the local people, therefore, um, own the projects. They own the income from these projects. And make, they make the choices about how that income, how that money should be spent. And the main focus of the expenditure um, that they choose is education and health, um, and in particular, water. So supplies of fresh water are, are critical here. Um, the large majority of people don't have access to water in their homes. They need to use uh, public water pipes, public wells. And before our work here, it was quite common for very large schools. In fact, there was a local school with more than 500 children with no access to water at all. So children were going to, to spend their day at school in temperatures of 30 degrees or more um, with no access to water. Uh, so that's been a major focus for, for people. Um, so I'm often asked why these projects have been successful. The Mikoka Pamoja, which means mangroves together, has been now running for 10 years. So it's the oldest uh, so-called blue carbon uh, project in the world. And uh, many people try to do this and it often turns out to be more difficult than people expect. Um, but uh, a few tips for success. You need really good communication and engagement. So people will happy to work with us on this, but only if, if there's good trust. Um, so there's lots of communication and engagement going on. There's a lot of partnership. As I said, um, there are many people involved in these kinds of nature-based solution projects, um, and they include the Kenyan government um, and the, the local communities, local community groups, but also the NGO here called ACES, which sells the carbon credits, and lots of scientific tech, uh, and technical experts as well. Um, and there does need to be somebody who actually does the sales. So um, it's not enough just to generate credits um, or to do the science, somebody has to go out and generate the money. Um, and that's the role of this, this charity um, called ACES, to, to find people who want to buy credits and to, and to sell them. So this is my last slide. And um, this is just to make the point that carbon offsetting, which we're doing, um, has a role to play when we think about the challenge of climate change but it has a relatively small role in my view. Um, and what we need is all of these things. We, there is no single solution to the massive challenge the climate crisis uh, presents us. Um, we need to be moving forward on all of these fronts. And it's very important uh, for, for people like myself, for example, who are involved in offsetting, to be working on these other things as well and to make sure that offsetting is not used as some kind of excuse to avoid the kinds of political changes that we need to move towards a low carbon economy. Thank you very, very much, Mark. I think that was very interesting. And I've learned a lot that I didn't know before about mangroves. Uh, we have one question first coming in here from uh, Mar Marissa. Artificial wetlands work similar to natural mangroves, question mark, do they? Uh, yes, they do. So people on land um, in terrestrial ecosystems often use phragmites uh, or species of reeds, for example, and other water plants to filter out especially phosphorus and nitrogen, those two pollutants, but they can also remove uh, microbes from wastewater. Um, mangroves can perform a very similar function. In fact, they do, they do it probably slightly more efficiently than those, those wetlands. Um, so people do use mangroves to, to treat wastewater effluent. Um, they do it either deliberately, um, but in, many, in most places they do it just because the mangroves are there. And so many people, for example, use mangroves, they, they use mangroves as latrines, as toilets. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Sakib wants to know, how do the local residents deal with the water crisis? For instance, the case study that you showed. So they have, um, th there are two types of water crises that they have, I suppose. Um, there's an, the ongoing, the routine problem that people have, which is accessing clean water, potable water. And uh, there's plenty of water in this, there's plenty of rainfall. So they're not short, it's not like some areas of Kenya, which are very arid. Um, there's the, the, the water table is quite high. Um, so if you can dig a well, then you can access water, but it's expensive to dig wells. There's, there's a coral bedrock here. So it just costs money to dig and maintain wells. And that's what, that's been a major expenditure um, as a result of this project. So people have said, we need more wells and we need more reliable sources. The other kind of water pressure on people, especially at Vanga is, is flooding. So there's annual flooding at one of these sites. Um, and again, uh, and, and in fact, there's a, there's a seawall, a concrete seawall that's been built by the government um, in some of the areas of this coast, that's extremely expensive and not all that effective. So, as I said, maintaining and enhancing mangrove forests can do a lot to protect the coastline from flooding. Right, thank you. But you said it's very time consuming to, to, to use mangroves, well, or to replant mangroves and until they become efficient, is it so? Well, that when I said that, I had in mind carbon capture. Mm. So the mangroves are doing all of these great functions, all these ecosystem services that they're providing. So one of the services is, is protection for the coastline, another service is nurseries for fish, another service is filtering the, the, the water. Um, and then there's this service of capturing carbon. Of all of those, the only one that we can sell, the only one we can actually raise money for is at the moment is carbon. And that's because there's a market of people willing to, to buy carbon credits. And the carbon that a small tree will capture is quite small. Um, so actually, mangroves become quite good at, at, at maintaining coastlines and providing habitat for fish, um, even when they're quite small trees. So that's the other functions um, are performed quite quickly by small trees. Our challenge is how do you monetize those? How do you, how do you get returns for people? Right, thank you. So Kip has a follow-up question. What type of techniques are used for carbon capture? So the trees themselves are, are superb at capturing carbon. That's their job, if you like. They do that naturally. And many people are interested in inventing uh, new technology to capture carbon. Most of it is extremely expensive and uh, provisional at best. So. I think the best thing we can do is to look after our, the natural technology that has been doing this for millions of years. That, techno that technology is wild eco is ecosystems such as mangroves. So if you can maintain a mangrove forest, it will capture something like uh, 20 tons of CO2 per year um, per hectare. Um, so it's just capturing that carbon and it's burying it, burying it. And that's semi-permanent burial, you know, burial for hundreds to thousands of years in, in the sediment. That's amazing. Those are really amazing figures. And if we look at these um, natural techniques or nature-based solutions, um, what are the trends that you see? Is the interest growing? Is it remaining the same? Uh, what are the trends in this area? So the financial trends are very interesting. Uh, when we first started to sell credits, uh, we struggled to find a market. And that was partly because we're not market. That's not, a, that's not our expertise. I'm, I'm a marine scientist. So marine scientists aren't trained to sell things to people. Um, so we, there was some learning to do, but mainly it was because uh, the market was quite small and we had to persuade people. What we find now is that we're completely oversubscribed um, so it's very much a seller's market at the moment. Uh, last week, I was speaking to a new American startup bank and they said, oh, we'd like we're looking to invest one billion dollars in nature based solutions. What can you offer? And of course, 
we can offer very, very small amounts. So there's a great demand for these kinds of credits. The, a lot of that has been driven by Greta Thunberg. Um, she's really revolutionized. Suddenly people are starting, many people are noticing climate change. Um, which is a very good thing. And many organizations have now made commitments to zero carbon. But when they start thinking about what that actually means, uh, they start realizing that they've got to find offsetting. So actually at the moment, it's very hard to find really reliable, ethical, large volumes of ethical offsetting. By ethical, I mean offsetting in which the, the money really goes to the people who need it most. Um, there's a lot of for-profit institutions in this space now looking to make to make profits from it. And maybe that's fine, but that, that's not what we do. That's not our model. Um, and I'm much more comfortable personally working on a philanthropic or charitable model. All right. Thank you. Uh, Nadia also says, what do you do to communicate your project to journalists so that they are more aware of the work you do and understand it? And communication is really challenging in this area. I know that's your, your expertise and your professional expertise. It's a, it's a complicated story to tell. Uh, it's, it's quite scientifically complicated, but it's also complicated in terms of policy. Um, so communication is a real challenge, both to you know, members of the public, to, to local people in the communities um, and for journalists. There's also a, there's a, an additional political element to this, which is around what we might call greenwashing, which is where companies attempt to, you know, invest in offsetting as an excuse so that they can carry on um, damaging the environment. Um, and clearly, and many journalists are worried about that. Many people, in the, I'm worried about that too. So we have to be quite careful about those issues. A really nice way to communicate it, the best way, in my view, is... Um, to host journalists at our project sites. And many people have visited these sites, many journalists as well, and documentary makers. So that's a really nice experience usually for people because they're able to go to the forest and they're also able to speak to local people and look at some of the benefits that this kind of work brings. myself i forget that the whole time thank you very much mark uh mama risa made just a point here that you have a very important message about ethics and credits and the organizations who get them and on that line i just wanted to ask uh, also a last question perhaps um you were talking about offsetting and some and the greenwashing and the danger or the risk of greenwashing and how do we how do we make sure, what are the challenges to make sure that offsetting is just not an excuse or it doesn't become an excuse to, to keep on uh, polluting the world in, in other ways? I mean, it must be a huge challenge there. Yeah, I guess speaking not necessarily from the perspective of our project, but more generally, I think there are two key approaches to that. One is to recognize scale. So for example, if Saudi Aramco or Shell approach us, and actually we have been approached by some fossil fuel companies and say, oh, we want to buy some carbon credits from you. The answer is a polite no. And that's because the scale of this kind of forest conservation project is so tiny compared to the massive emissions and damage that these fossil fuel companies are responsible for that it can only be, I think, a form of greenwash if they get involved. So that's the first answer. The second answer is to look at people's um, behavior. So the, the difficulty is, of course, we need to encourage change. We need to encourage change for ourselves, but also, and most importantly, for, for corporations and for politicians. So we don't want to say to somebody, no, we're not going to work with you because you have a, just because of your history. Um, but what we are able to do is to tell whether you're sincere about change. So there's a, there's a, I think it's your Swedish burger chain called Max Burger. Do you have such a thing in Sweden? So they're an interesting case study. Um, anything that sells meat is likely to have a very bad climate impact. Um, eating, you know, eating lots of meat we know has, has huge climate impacts, but Max Burger 
kind of realized this about 15 years ago, I think, and made a commitment to change what they were doing. So I think they still have quite an impact, but they've moved a long way towards providing plant-based alternatives in their restaurants, and they also offset. So they're a good example of how you can say, okay, we've got these emissions, we're gonna do what we can um, to change that. That's going to take you know, a while, but at the same time, we're going to use offsetting to deal with the emissions that we can't avoid. And so you can look at their record and say, yes, we, we believe them. We believe they're, they're moving in the right direction. Right, thank you very much, very wise words. Uh, and I think that will end this session about mangroves. Thank you, Mark, for, for coming to, to the World Water Week Communications Initiative. Uh, very interesting to hear you. And we are going to stay near the coast, or rather, we are going to move into the oceans. And our next speaker is Bethany Carney Almrut. There we go. Hi. Hi, welcome to the program. Thank you. Bethany is professor and researcher at the University of Gothenburg, and you will talk about uh, water pollution in our oceans and the environmental effects, effects of plastics. Uh, Very yes. welcome to you. Thank you. And I've decided to use the planetary boundaries framework to do that, to talk about the large scale problems that we're facing today. And I'm just going to share my screen and I'll explain to you what that framework is. And then towards the end, come into something about how we've been communicating about this. Uh, and I think we really hit a nerve with this work here. Okay. So the Planetary Boundaries Framework was written in 2009 by a group of researchers in Stockholm at the Stockholm Resilience Center. And they identified nine processes that regulate the stability and the resilience of the earth system. And it was from a very anthropogenic viewpoint, like what, what um, like the boundaries that define the safe operating space for humanity. How can humans survive on the planet and what do we need? And what, and what are we through our activities affecting? And the nine boundaries that they de designed or designated were about ozone, uh, loss of biodiversity, climate change, ocean acidification, freshwater consumption, land system changes, nitrogen and phosphorus flows, atmospheric aerosol loading, and number nine, the release of chemical pollution and novel entities. So this is where I'll be focusing. Uh, given my background as an ecotoxicologist and plastic researcher. So this is the, 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 the overall summary of the knowledge, state of knowledge in 2015. So a number of years after the framework was designed. And as you can see, the novel entities had not yet been uh, quantified or even thoroughly described for, in terms of where the boundary might be or if there's a threshold and whether or not we were outside of that safe zone. So during the past few years, a few of us uh, got together, had some workshops to discuss this, building on the concept of what a novel entity is. And we were working with this part of the definition that looks at chemicals and engineered materials that are not previously known to the earth systems. So that includes plastics. And then trying to devise a way to understand how much we're producing and how that's affecting the earth. And we were faced with a bit of a problem because a lot of the other groups that worked with climate change, for example, ocean acidification, for example, could look at one parameter like carbon dioxide levels or like pH in the oceans, and then look at what that looked like during the Holocene. And the Holocene was a period of time around 10,000 years when the earth was very stable, when humans developed and prospered, our populations grew, we, we uh, found a lot of different ways to interact with the planet and, and nature, but have now moved in to the Anthropocene where humans are the major driving force for change on the planet. And the other groups could look back at the Holocene and say, okay, this is the carbon dioxide levels at that time point, or this is the pH at that time point. How much has it changed? And have we changed it so far that we're sort of moving into an, an area of, of destabilization? Are we affecting the earth systems? When it comes to novel entities like chemicals and plastics, we couldn't do that because those didn't exist during the Holocene. These are things that we have created. And these are the defining factors of the Anthropocene, the time period in which we live. So we, we had to find a new way to do that because the baseline, the, the background concentration of these things is zero. And it would be, I mean, we could have written a paper and said like the, the background is zero, we've surpassed that and now we're in trouble. But it would have been completely inoperable. It would have been a number that we could do nothing with. So we started looking at other ways to try to understand the problem and try to understand how much we're affecting the earth. And to put that into perspective, a paper came out in 2020 by Zhang Yong Wang and his group, trying to get an inventory for how many chemicals 
we are producing. And when I say chemicals here, I'm talking about anthropogenic chemicals. So synthetic chemicals that humans are making. It's not all of the other natural molecules that exist on the planet. So 350,000 different chemicals are in production by human societies. And that's a much bigger number than we previously thought. So we had previously thought it was around 100,000, but they came back with the number 350,000 by surveying chemical inventories from different countries around the world. In that number, they found that 50,000 were confidential and 70,000 were ambiguously described. So even though we know how many they are, we still don't know what they are. We don't even know what they are. So there are massive knowledge gaps in what we're talking about here. The same group also looked at plastics. And a lot of people will think plastic. I know what plastic is and, and I have a lot of plastics around me and, and you might know that there's polyethylene and polypropylene and, and polystyrene. There's a few different kinds of plastics but there are in fact thousands of different kinds of polymers and plastics also contain chemicals. These are added during the production process or they're added to a product to give it certain qualities like color or, or softness or hardness and so on. And they came back with an inventory here of 10,000 different chemicals that are in plastics materials. In this paper, they also cross-checked this list of chemicals with what we know about toxicity of the chemicals. And they found that more than 2,400 of the chemicals were designated as hazardous. So we know that we're putting 2,400 different kinds of chemicals into plastics and that these are hazardous chemicals. Even more concerning was that there is an even bigger number of chemicals where we have no data at all. We don't know what these chemicals are doing. So we don't know if they're toxic or not. We don't know if they're degrading or not. Again, a lot of knowledge gaps and some warning signs. Finally, we looked at some other papers to try to understand what do we know about what chemicals are doing in the environment? So a lot of our chemical testing is done in laboratories. It's done through standardized tests. A lot of times it's with a single species, a Daphne, a water flea, for example, or maybe a species of fish. We use some kinds of algae for this kind of testing, but that doesn't necessarily translate into what's happening in the environment. So what do we know about what chemicals are doing to ecosystems in the environment? How is the toxicity of chemicals affecting ecosystems? And, and this group, uh, some of whom are from Sweden, looked at uh, tens of thousands, I think 130,000 different scientific publications. And they found that we were focusing on a very small number of chemicals in our research. Most of them were pharmaceuticals or biocides, metals, plant production products, and reach substances. So those are industrial chemicals that are registered under the European chemical legislation but that we only were focusing on 65 chemicals when it came to understanding what the chemicals are doing in the environment. So if you compare that number back to how many chemicals there are, 350,000 different chemicals, and we know what 65 of them are doing in the environment. So we have massive, massive knowledge gaps here. A lot of times industry is not even telling us what the chemicals are, never mind giving us information about their potential toxicity or effects in the environment. And then finally, if we're going to look at drivers of global change, what is happening on the planet, there are a lot of studies looking at things like, um, like climate change, for example, ocean acidification, biodiversity loss, all very important questions. But if we're going to focus on chemicals, the number of papers or the percentage of papers that focus on chemicals as drivers of global change is very small, less than half of a percent of the work that we're doing to understand the effects on the planet are focused on chemicals. And that is, is uh, despite the fact that production rates are increasing. So the graphs that you see there show um, synthetic fertilizers and pesticides and production of chemicals and pharmaceuticals around the globe. These are all increasing very steeply. Plastics, for example, are thought to triple in production in the coming years and chemicals will be on that same level. Okay, so now we know this, we know we know how many chemicals there are. We know, we know that we have massive knowledge gaps about what they are, about what they're doing in the environment. And we wanna to try to understand what they're doing to the planet. How do we do that when we have all of these knowledge gaps? And we decided to look at the whole big picture, starting with extraction. So for all of these substances, all of the chemicals and plastics, we have to go back to the raw materials, which for a lot of them is fossil fuels. So for 98 or 99% of plastics today are produced from fossil fuels. A lot of chemicals, agrochemicals, pesticides, and so on are produced from fossil fuels. Then we move into a production phase where the raw materials are used to make the products, the chemicals themselves or products that are being used that are reaching the market or that, that are remaining within industry. And these might be leaking out into the environment at, at any point. And we also have problems then after the consumer phase or even materials that don't necessarily flow through consumers' hands, we have a waste management problem. 
and this looks differently around the world, depending on where we are. Some places have fairly well-functioning infrastructure and waste management strategies. Others lack this completely. So the impact of waste is very different in different parts of the world, but it's still a problem in, in all parts of the world. The next step is to understand once these things reach the environment, what are they doing? And then whether or not that impact is affecting planetary stability. So we, we looked at this, this pathway here and we called it our impact pathway. So this is the same picture, but translated into words now. We're looking at extraction of resources and the production of the novel entities. So the novel entities are the new things, the not natural human produced things. Then moving from there into release into the environment, they're spread through, throughout the globe. What do we know about how, how chemicals are spreading around the planet? We know, for example, that we find forever chemicals, these that are used in, in Teflon, in raincoats and so on, are found in polar bears and they're found in whales. They're found across the planet and they're disrupting reproduction in these animals. Do we know anything about how sus sustainable these chemicals are or whether they're degrading? And then do we have any information about disruptions of earth systems processes? So along this pathway, and, and this is a difference from the other boundaries, the planetary boundaries, we're moving from a, a technical domain into an environmental domain. And the environmental domain is what we're interested in, what is happening in the environment, but we're starting in the technological domain because, because of the problems that we have with the vast numbers of, of entities and lacks of information. And another thing that we were careful to, to look at was, was lock-in. So we have this sort of propensity in our societies to, to invest money, for example, in infrastructure for, for fossil fuel extraction, if that's oil drilling or fracking. And then once we shift our production lines away from, for example, fuel, fuel usage, then the industries that have invested money in this infrastructure will look for another home for those products. So as we're moving away from fossil fuels as an energy source in transportation, those companies are moving them into plastics and they're making more plastics as we're using yet less, fewer fossil fuels in, in transportation. So this is an example of lock-in. Then we wanted to understand what kinds of characteristics do our, our entities have? Are they, how are they spreading? Can we retain them within our societies? Are they being lost from our, our systems? Can we can contain them through wastewater, through waste management and so on? Are they degrading? And then finally, are they interacting with functions of the planet? And we came up with three different kinds of information that we could use to understand these processes. And we call them control variables. The first is in the technological domain, looking at production and volume. The second is in mass concentrations in the environment. And the third is earth system effects. So if we take the first step and we're looking at trends in production, we have volumes of chemicals and plastics. And then importantly, the share of chemicals that ha have safety data or regulatory data. How are we handling these chemicals in society? And as you saw in a previous picture, and this is some data that we pulled together for this study, production is, has been increasing for the past 20 years. And a lot of these things have been being in production since the late 1800s. So obviously production has increased very much since that point. And we're expecting an exponential increase in production going forward. Then when it comes to regulation, I'm gonna use the European chemicals legislation as an example, partly because that's where I am and what I know best, but also partly because it's one of the strongest chemical regulatory agencies in the world. There are a few in different places around the, the globe that have good chemicals regulation, but this is one of the, the best. As I said, we have 350,000 chemicals in production, 143,000 of those are registi registered on the European market. And the European market requires that chemicals that are produced over a thousand tons a year are produced or imported should have dossiers submitted, and those dossiers should include toxicity data. So 48,000 dossiers have been submitted. But the European Chemicals Agency only, well, they aspire to check 25% of those dossiers. In reality, that number is much lower because of funding and time and, and how complicated these issues are. And 74% of the dossiers that they look at fail to provide important safety information. So this, is, this system is based on industry reporting. So the industries that are importing or producing these chemicals should be reporting this data to ECA and they're not doing it or they're not doing it carefully and properly. So here we have a big problem in how we're regulating and managing chemicals. Then when it comes to the next step in our, our next control variable, release of these entities to the environment, we looked at emissions of chemicals and emissions of plastics into the environment. And here I'll take an example from data showing emissions of plastics into the environment. 
And this shows predictions of the amounts of plastics that might be reaching the environment in the future, given different scenarios. And you'll see three different colors there, yellow, blue, and purple. So the yellow line shows us business as usual. If we continue as we are when, with regards to production and waste management and use of these materials, we will see a massive increase in release to the environment over time. And this is predicting it to the year 2030. The blue line in the middle shows what this scenario would look like given ambitious targets. And that's targets like the, the bans on single-use plastics, on bags, on better waste management strategies and infrastructures, on take-back programs. If we were to implement all of those strategies that we have in place right now, we will still see an increase of plastic release to the environment. And the target that what we're aiming for is below 8 million tons per year. So that's the bottom line, the purple line. And that's still a lot, 8 million tons a year of plastics released into the environment. So we're not getting to zero. We're just getting to less than a lot. And the, the four small pictures on the side show what this looks like in different countries around the world, dividing the countries into high income countries, upper middle income countries, lower income countries, lower middle income countries, and lower income. And you can see that the two middle income countries are or groups of countries are where we have the biggest problems. So the high income countries are better at managing the waste and the low income countries um, are using as much waste. Taking into consideration the injustices in waste movement across the planet on who's responsible for the waste that is produced. Then the third control variable, what is happening on the planet? What do we know about the toxicity of chemical pollution? And what do we know about disturbances of chemicals to the bios or plastics to the biosphere? And here we use different terminology. So when we talk about chemicals, we talk about toxicity, but plastics have an additional characteristics that, compared to chemicals, which is that they're, they have like a physical entity, they're a mass. They have a, a shape and a size and a density that, that it can physically interact with organisms in a way that molecules do not. So as an example of the first step, what do we know about chemical pollution? So one of our authors is a, works a lot with uh, uh, life cycle assessments, life cycle impact assessments, and he did a calculation for two chemicals. And those were metallochlor, which is a pesticide, and bisphenol A, BPA, which is a, a polymeric molecule that's used as a plastic additive. They looked at how much of these chemicals are produced, where they're used, what kinds of products they're used in, how they might be released to air, to land, or to soil through different processes, and then what their toxicity is. So what do we know about the toxicity and the effects of these two chemicals in the environment? And then they, they calculated this space based on the volume of fresh water in Europe. And they found that these two chemicals are taking up one one hundred hundredth of the uh, quote unquote available space of toxicity. So they're driving a thousandth of the toxicity you might see in the environment. And that's for two chemicals out of 350,000. And others have said that this is a vast underestimation. Others that have looked at these calculations have said this is, this is likely vastly underestimated. And in the 1980s, when uh, when these problems first started really coming to the forefront, or I guess you could argue that they, they came to the forefront in the 1960s already, but there was this, this way of speaking about dilution, like, well, we're just poured into the ocean. The ocean is so vast, humans can never affect the ocean. The solution to pollution is dilution, but this is clearly showing that that is not the case. And then finally, we tried to understand how these novel entities might be connecting to other planetary boundaries. So we can connect both chemicals and plastics to loss of biodiversity. They're both changing the microbes in the environment. They're both leading to in increases in invasive species in changes in ecosystems, functions, and structures. Chemicals and plastics are very clearly tied to climate change, for example, through plastics, which is essentially a carbon dioxide in a solid form. It comes from oil, it becomes plastic, and can then become carbon dioxide again if it's burned or slowly degrades in the environment. We see changes in the way we're using fresh water. Plastics can, again, through their physical nature, lead to flooding and things like this. We see changes in our land system uses from extractive processes or, or processes or landfilling. Nitrogen and phosphorus flows are changing in, in that we're changing the basic microbial structures of microbial communities in the environment. So nitrogen and phosphorus fixation and flows are changing in the environment. 
And of course, chemicals and plastics when burned can lead to increased um, atmospheric aerosols. So there's a lot of connections to other boundaries and other ways that these entities are destabilizing the planet. So if we go through, list all of the, the, um, the different control variables that we described and sum them up, for most of them, we can say, yes, we have transgressed the boundaries. So the trends and productions of chemicals and plastics is increasing. The reason why we say we can't say we're safe is because that is very far removed from planetary function. That's at the beginning of our impact pathway, if you'll remember. So we can't draw a direct correlation between production volumes and effect, but we can do that once we start accounting for, for uh, toxicity and dis disruption, disruptions to biosphere integrity. So what we concluded then was that we have transgressed the boundary, that we are outside of the safe operating space for humanity. And this was what we communicated. This image was used to communicate these results. And, and this was the, the message that we came to after we had done this work, which took us about two years to get through. And it was a, it was a message that was received very widely across the planet. A lot of journalists, a lot of news stories, a lot of podcasts, a lot of webinars about this question. But we, I also wanted to mention that there are a lot of things happening on the policy side. And I know that this work is being used in the dialogues that are happening here. So the United Nations Environmental Assembly had a meeting this uh, March, and there were a few decisions that were made there that are relevant for this discussion. One is a binding resolution on plastic waste, which should be written in the next two years. And then the second is that there, we should form an intergovernmental science policy panel to address chemicals, waste, and pollution. And then at the same time, there are being updates to the Stockholm Convention, the Basel Convention, among others, which are regulating use of chemicals and, and transport of waste and trade with different toxic substances. So the IPCP will be looking at disseminating information about chemicals, acting internationally with different countries to participate in knowledge regarding chemicals and management and to advise international organizations, NGOs and other parties for the safe management of chemicals. Oh, here, here's what I had some information about the, the uh, journalism and communication. So we had, we, uh, we were contacted by a, uh, a journalist at The Guardian. We had, we had prepared actually a, a press release package about this work. So translating sort of the scientific language of the work into uh, something that is uh, more colloquial and it was picked up by a lot of journalists around the world, but this is the article that got the most impact and it was trending number one on Reddit around the globe. So we beat out uh, Activision Blizzard, COVID-19 and Donald Trump. That was this winter when these were all sort of big global discussions. And it's, it's also important because Reddit is a forum where you don't find a lot of academics, maybe you're scientists, but rather regular people, again, again, air quotes, regular people. It started as a gaming platform. So maybe a younger audience than you'll find in other places. And some of the, so it was, it was trending worldwide on the main billboard, but it was also trending in science, world news, environment, climate, sustainability, boring dystopia, dark futurology. So not all of the messages were positive, but we sort of, it tapped into something that I think a lot of people around the planet are concerned about and, uh, and want to talk more about. And that's what I hope you guys can help us do too. So I'll stop there and I thank my uh, co-authors and stop sharing then so I can take questions if you have any. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bethany. Again, very insightful and a lot of new knowledge. Uh, we have a first question here coming in from Mar Marissa. Super comprehensive talk. Thank you very much. Education of engineers and use of gray water footprint comes to my mind in terms of awareness, among a lot of other ideas to focus on. And mm. you have, do you want to? Hook so there, up I to can that? just say regarding water, not gray water, but green water. There is a an, an update after our paper came out. There was an update on the water boundary. I don't think I have that on my slide, but the um, this picture that I showed with the results here, I can bring it back up. Um, so this, this freshwater use, you can see that in this image here, it's inside the safe operating space, but the newest update of that, which came a few weeks ago, divides th this freshwater usage into two categories, green water and blue water, where green water is the water that's in 
plants and, and trees and so on. And that has been now calculated as having transgressed the safe operating space. So blue water is still within the safe boundaries, green water is not. So that was the next update that came just a few months after this picture was created. I don't know about gray water though. But All right. Thank you. If you have any follow up question on that, Mama Marissa, just type ahead in the chat box. Um, I wanted to ask you, you were talking about this, this uh, binding resolution on plastic waste uh, that is about to happen or is about to be written. It's in negotiations now. There are in negotiations now. What are May. your expectations? So, so when the resolutions were submitted to the, the meeting in March for voting, there were two major resolutions that had the most weight behind them. One of them was focusing on marine pollution and the other was focusing on plastic from a more life cycle perspective from production to use and then into the circular economy and finally pr pollution prevention. And it was that second more comprehensive resolution that was adopted, which I was very happy to see. What they don't do in that resolution is include any text about additives. So they haven't, they've, re they've removed that, they purposely removed that language from the resolution. And that concerns me because plastics are, as I said, uh, home to 10,000 chemicals. A lot of these are hormone disruptive. And there are, there's, there's a, a lot of evidence showing how plastics affect health. So the chemicals and plastics are leaching through our everyday use, through food contact materials, through our indoor environment, our built environment. And the, those chemicals are linked to, to increased uh, rates of some kinds of cancer, to decrease fertility, to changes in morphology of, of, our, of our infants and decrease sperm count and mobility, decrease peanut size, increase metabolic disorders, obesity, diabetes, thyroid hormone disruption. These are all linked to chemicals that are found in plastics. And if we don't take care of those, we can't recycle plastics safely. And we're also continuing to use toxic chemicals, which are then spread to the environment through use of plastics. And these plastic chemicals are found, as I said, in polar bears and whales and so on. So my hope is that we can put chemicals back onto the agenda, that we can have that, that those discussions and we can make sure that we're including that for, for the safety of everyone involved. And there are different groups of people that are impacted more by these problems than others, the lower economic groups, for example, women and children, for example. So there are more uh, vulnerable groups in, in societies that we need to protect better. So I want, I want us to remember to talk about chemicals. Right, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Mama Riss is just clarifying here, the gray water is the, the polluted, water. polluted water. Yeah, Yeah. so they, they didn't delineate that boundary fresh water into gray. It was just blue and green. Just blue and green, right. Yeah. And, and what about, uh, we're talking about um, when she says like educating engineers and the use of gray water, are we talking about uh, basically not recycling, but um, remediation maybe yes yeah yeah and there there are a lot of efforts underway to find ways to use wastewater depending on what that wastewater is but to clean it because fresh water is becoming uh bristvara. i just lost an english word yeah uh, a limited resource uh, yeah, yeah sorry i also lost it <laughs> yeah. it's becoming a limited resource and and a luxury resource in some places so if we can find ways to remediate wastewater so it can be used, then I think we'll, this is something that engineers are definitely working on now. Yeah, definitely. And, and Claudia has, has another reflection, another question about communication. Uh, the population does not relate to the production and use of plastics with the consequences of health. How do we better or become better in communicating that? So I think, for, so we've known about some of these chemical, chemicals toxicities for many, many decades but we haven't talked about it that much. And I think it's because chemicals are hard to talk about. They're hard to pronounce. We can't see them. We don't really understand exactly what they're doing because scientists will start talking about the molecular structure and what target it's binding to and so on, that, that we have not necessarily been very good at communicating that. And that the, the public maybe hasn't felt the need to be aware of it because they didn't know about the problem. But I think, and this is my personal opinion, but I think plastics really opened that door because plastics is something that is very tangible and very visible and it can um, evoke a very visceral response if you're seeing images of, of animals that are, that are injured or, or dead with 
plastics in their gut and that this sort of opened a door to us explaining how the things that we're making and using are spreading to other parts of the planet. And then we can start talking about plastics and chemicals and plastics, and we can talk more about the chemicals. So I think, I think that's been a very useful tool for communicating these problems. And I think public awareness really has increased. And I also think scientists have gotten better at talking about their science. Some of, some of us at least. No, that's very great. And, and we will have more talk about that a little bit later on today. And uh, Nadia here says, what are the regulations uh, regarding production of chemicals worldwide, chemicals mm -hmm. worldwide? And how is it that chemical can be made and used, but its details not released and approved by an appropriate government authority? Yeah, we'll take both those yeah that doesn't make sense. So when it comes to production of chemicals worldwide, it's not regulated, not on a global scale. It's regulated on national, local scales, but not globally. And that's another thing that we're talking about with the plastics treaty, that we should look at a global cap on production, that we should have like a max amount. And then, I mean, the details of how that would work would be very complicated, like who gets to produce it and where and why. But when it comes to chemicals, and there is no global regulation on it. We do have, through the United Nations, there are a number of different bodies regulating some chemicals. So there are, the, the Stockholm list that I mentioned earlier is a list of chemicals that should not be produced. They should be banned globally. And of course, this will only be followed by countries that sign on to the treaty. So a country could choose not to do that and then ignore the rules that are put forth there. But this is things like some of the pesticides. So pesticides are a special group of chemicals because we have, we have designed them to kill things and then we pour them into the environment and then they kill things. They also kill other things, which is part of the problem. And they end up places where we don't mean for them to be and they continue killing things. So some of the chemicals on that list are pesticides. Some of them are industrial chemicals that were not designed to be toxic, but were shown to be toxic. A good example there is PBC, which disrupted reproduction in a lot of top predators in the marine environment. And those are, are banned and have been banned for decades for global production, but they're still in the environment because they're still in our built environment. They're still in our infrastructures. They also degrade very slowly. Uh, CFCs are another example. And these were chemicals that were degrading the ozone layer. And when that problem was identified, then the global community came together and said, these chemicals are disrupting the ozone layer. It's endangering life on earth. We need to stop. And, and the world stopped. That being said, they're now being produced again in China, uh, I guess illegally from the, the global perspective, from the Stockholm's, uh, from the view of the Stockholm Convention. But again, it's international regulations and these are hard to regulate. How is it possible that we're releasing toxic chemicals when we don't know what they are? I mean, the chemical industry is, is very powerful. They lobby a lot. They, they try to place the burden of proof on, for example, scientists, like we'll prove to us that it's toxic. While in reality, the burden of proof should lie with them to prove that it's safe, but this does not always happen. And people would assume that the things that are on the market in your shampoo or in your in your frying pan are safe, but they're not. And, and, and that, that this makes me so mad because the health costs associated with these chemicals are astronomical, like in the billions of dollars or billions of euros per year in healthcare costs, in uh, lost work, work time and so on, lost income. And the companies are not paying for this. They're making money and everyone else is paying the price. So there are a lot of externalities associated with chemicals that are not being accounted for. And there are a lot of gaps in regulation. There are a lot of knowledge gaps and, and current chemicals regulations regulates one chemical at a time. And there are 350,000 of them. So we can produce the data to regulate them and then to manage them in the way that we need to given the current yeah, I said, it's the nature of our of our laws. So what we really should do is, and this is something that's being discussed and we're moving in this direction, but start grouping chemicals. And instead of handling them one at a time, handle them as a group. And that's being discussed a lot with like the PFOS, these fluorinated, perfluorinated compounds that are called forever chemicals. Right. Yeah. There, there are about four and a half thousand of them. And there are discussions to ban the whole group, ban all four and a half thousand of them and not go through them one at a time because we don't, right. we don't have time for that. Now that that sounds very reasonable to treat them as the group, I say. Um, I'm sorry, we have to stop there. Very okay. interesting. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, thanks for coming to the program. And um, thank you all for, for an interesting discussion. We are now going to welcome our next speaker, uh, Frederick Mugira 
founder of Water Journalist Africa and co-founder of Infernile Geo Journalism Project. Hello, Frederick. How are you? Good, good. How are you doing? Fine, thank you. Fine, thank you. Welcome very much yeah. to the, the communications initiative. And um, thank you so much. You are going to talk about Werner Water Journalist Africa investigative journalism and the benefit of working together in networks. Yes. Yes. Over to you. Okay, thank you so much. I would like to share uh, my slides uh, as I will show you. Okay, uh, this is the right one. So, um, as I told you, I am um, the founder of the Journalist Africa and co founder of Infonite. These are networks of journalists in Africa. And um, I'm going to take you through you know, uh, collaborative journalism and how this has helped us to. Uh, work with journalists and produce uh, good journalism in Africa. Uh, yeah, so what a journalists Africa is a network of journalists in Africa, uh, you know, spread across 50 countries, and we practice, you know, what a journalism. Uh, this is a network I started in uh, 2011 uh, in uh, South Africa with the other, uh, you know, we had some other group of uh, journalists. Uh, so uh, 2017, uh, under Water Journalists Africa, we launched a flagship project called InfoNile. Now, InfoNile is uh, a, a geojournalism platform, and we are spread across 11 countries in the, in the Nile Basin. There are 11 countries in the Nile Basin, and uh, those are the ones we work with, although it, is hard, it has been hard for us to penetrate each year. So we, under InfoNile, we practice a collaborative journalism. And so our mission is to uncover political stories on the water issues eh, in those 11 countries. And we do this through, you know, uh, data-based multimedia storytelling. Uh, later, you know, I will show you some of the stories that we have worked on as uh, a group of journalists. Yeah, so our approach is that we identify a theme of common, you know, cross-border importance. For example, in the past, we have done a, so it's around biodiversity in transboundary lakes, uh, plastic pollution of Lake Victoria, you know, uh, we discussed it during COVID-19. These are themes that we have picked in the past and worked on. Right? Uh, yeah, so when we do identify a theme of cross, of common and cross-border importance, we go ahead and you know, source credible data from uh, cross-cutting, uh, you know, across, you know, that data that is cross-cutting across the countries that project is based in. Uh, yeah, some of these projects that we have done have, have been based in the, you know, the East Africa, and several are in the Nile Basin. So then when we, are, when we are working on these projects, we want to you know, first identify data that is cross-cutting. Like I told you, we do purely you know, uh, data journalism. And then later we call for pitches from journalists in the region that you know, uh, uh, we work with. Because we, we get grants from different funders, so then we also want to sub grant. And then before we sub grant, we call for pitches. Uh, we already have the theme, we have you know, data you know, cross, that is cross-cutting, then we call for pitches. When we identify journalists we want to work with, we mentor them and you know, train them in data journalism and you know, environmental and science reporting. Uh, this has, in the past, this has lasted for about, you know, six months. Some do last for a few months, like two, you know, yeah. And then others, I think we have also had a training that has lasted for two, two, um, two weeks. Eh? Uh, yeah. So then later, we, pub we let them publish the stories and, you know, uh, in their local media houses. Uh, some are translated, you know, are published in local media, in local languages in the region. Like I told you, there are so so many, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, languages in the region. And then also, uh, what what probably we can underline here is also that uh, we have coordinators in the region who translate these stories in different languages. Eh? Uh, we have a coordinator in Sudan who does uh, uh, Arabic. She translates into Arabic. We have a coordinator in Ethiopia who translates into uh, in Amharic. Then we have a coordinator for French in Rwanda, uh, a coordinator for Swahili in uh, Tanzania, and another one in Kenya. 
yeah, so then we work with these coordinators, mm -hmm. we translate these stories and have them published in, in, uh, in different media houses and also on our platform at Infonaya. Yeah, so then uh, later we create cross-border multimedia projects. We bring these stories. For example, if a project has eight journalists, we bring these stories together and form one project that we publish. But also we create actual interactive maps that go with uh, these uh, uh, stories, eh? uh, these projects. I'll show you one uh, later as we go on. Eh? So these are some of the projects we have worked on in the past. Uh, we have looked at access you know, to clean water during COVID-19 and climate change. Uh, this one, you can find it online, Thursday in the River Basin. Uh, threats by diversity in the, big lake, big, in the Nile Basin lakes. Uh, yeah, so this one, I will probably take you through this one. Um, yeah, so we have had several projects, as you can see. Uh, here, I'm probably we can underline, uh, since we've been looking at the plastic pollution, we can underline, underline the project we did on plastic pollution and solutions around the Victoria, which we worked on last year and worked with a group of journalists in the region, in, the, in Uganda, Kenya, and Tanzania, and we gave them journalism grants to do stories uh, around plastic pollution in their communities around the lake. And we got some challenging stories, you know, stories we didn't know. There are, there are several projects around the lake that are recycling plastics. And also we found it extremely hard to you know, get data up around the you know, plastic pollution in the lake. Not so many scientists have done yeah. Uh, research around plastics in Lake Victoria, but we found a lot of plastics eh? you know, on the beaches, everywhere. Uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, again, these are some of other projects that we have worked on. You can see we have done climate change, uh, you know, uh, solar energy, health. All in all, we have had, we have enabled the production of 224 database multimedia stories, and this is uh, since 2017 when we launched Infonaya. Uh, our stories now were published, and uh, I mean, were published by over 106 media houses in 12 languages. I told you, like, we have them in different languages, eh? and uh, in you know, 14 countries, these including you know, 48 online platforms, 30 radio stations, 21 newspapers, and nine TV stations. Yeah. So, we will lay ask a question, why have all these stories, you know, in different media houses and stuff like that, different languages? We want to make sure that the story sinks down to the, to the, the, the local communities. Eh? So then it does not end, you know, in, uh, in the newspaper, but also goes to the radio and the local language. And so then the communities affected can know. Uh, yeah, about the, uh, yeah. So you may ask a question, why this approach? Why are you doing this? You know. So then, um, my answer. Of course, these are not. But I wouldn't say. I mean, this uh, is just if, But uh, these are some of the answers I'll give you. That this this kind of collaborative, you know, working together, bringing journalists together to to you know work together enables journalists and media houses to, to go far beyond what they may be able to achieve. You know, on their own. Eh? Because remember now. Give them journalism grants, we pay them, we train them, and again we mentor them, we 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 also support them in editing their stories, which you know uh, right now some media houses may not do because they don't have money, especially you know with the uh, effects of corona. Then we also have partnerships and networking opportunities that journalists you know get through this kind of collaborative journalism. Right? Uh, then funding opportunities, like we give them grants to go to the field. We have given out grants of one thousand dollars, one thousand five hundred, and the listing uh, uh, three hundred dollars. This would this seems to be low, but it, some media houses in the in Africa do not pay uh, this amount of uh, I mean this amount to a journalist at the end of the month, you know. But for us, we give it for this one so to go out and investigate. Yeah, so again, we help them get pitching skills. Eh? It's important to know how to pitch. So then you get different grants from different uh, you know, uh, organizations that are offering these grants. Eh? Uh, it, also, it is easier to link to scientists 
scientific journals and academic institutions and, or experts. When you work in a group, when you work in a group, when you collaborate. Because also we mentor, we, we mentor them, uh, we give them you know, mentorship opportunities. Eh? And, they, and most of them have been you know, coming back to us and saying, ah, your training, your mentorship, you are good. We are working on this with Code for Africa with our partners in uh, Kenya and South Africa who do mental them in data journalism and they gain good skills. Eh? Uh, yeah, you know, cost cutting because now media houses do not have to uh, fund the whole project. We also give uh, part of the money through grants. Eh? Uh, also enables regional and global effects. Eh? Uh, yeah, so then these stories that we, we work on, because remember we are looking at a, a uh, we are looking at the, a resource that is a transboundary. So then we don't only, all, only look at uh, a picture, of, I mean, a, you know, a, like a community or a national picture, but you know, like a regional, like a river, like Nile Basin, and you know, global, or not only just the national effects. Yeah, so these are some of the lessons that we have learned as we do this. Uh, storytellers and media houses still choose to go it alone instead of collaborating. And you wonder why, you know, we, we have seen some benefits like this. But media houses and journalists still, still, you know, want to go it alone instead of collaborating. Yeah, and, you know, which, which, is, an, 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 which is not right. Uh, then also, there is little or no exposure to collaborative journalism. Uh, you find journalists, you know, don't, do not know what to do. They don't know who to, you know, to work with. Then when you offer opportunities that you can work with the journalist in Egypt, you can work with the journalist in, uh, in Kenya, because you're working on a story about River Nile and it's, you know, the river that goes all throughout these countries. And you find journalists, you know, welcoming these ideas. Yeah, there's, you know, lack of networks of journalists reporting on these topics. Yes, you may wonder, I mean, not so many journalists write about water. And you know, they drink it always, but they don't care about it because probably they think it is God given and to, to be there, like just like uh, you know, other community members think. But uh, there are so many stories around water, oh, and you don't have journalists uh, you know, uh, reporting about this. In some countries, you know, issues of transboundary resources are not open to the public. Yeah, and you know. You find that you know, writing about these things, writing, for example, about the Nile, there are some countries in the Nile Basin who say that's a sensitive topic. You don't do it, eh? you don't write about it. So then it becomes a big challenge. Eh? Yeah. And then also, little uh, budgets to take on you know, expensive projects. Uh, not so many media houses do this because they don't have money. You know, concentration is easy to report topics such as entertainment and politics. Because you know some journalists don't you know want to take on hard stuff, you know, science related topics. They choose to concentrate on easy topics such as entertainment and politics and do short stories. Eh? Uh, yeah, like we have seen competition versus collaboration. Media houses want to compete, to compete for the audience, you know, thinking that that way they will you know gain audience and then you know, sell to the uh, advertisers and gain money, but not knowing that collaboration would actually be uh, better than competing. Eh? Almost the same point is that, you know, profits right now are prevailing over principles. Eh? So then media houses now are targeting profits. They uh, want to maximize profits and they don't care about principles, you know, of having journalists work professionally, you know, training them, you know, investigating, taking the right way. They don't care because they don't have money. They want to uh, maximize profits. Uh, so they believe that the end justifies the means. Eh? Uh, yeah, again, then the trust gap between journalists and scientists. They, you, know, you find journalists don't work with you know, researchers because researchers do not trust them. They think they will misrepresent their uh, information. Eh? which is a very big uh, issue in the region that we fall now. Yeah, so uh, the, briefly, uh, this is how I think that, you know, uh, journalists, how this is what can help journalists in the region uh, or, or, you know, journalists out there to make sure that they report 
uh, on water topics in a way that promotes shared narrative. Eh? Uh, you know, stories on transboundary you know, topics should have regional significance. Eh? Yeah, so then it's not just a, a country thing, it's not a com your community thing, but it's a regional uh, story because uh, uh, it cuts across the region, not just one community. It's important to respect history and culture of people in the region. Because now if you're talking about a, a resource that is uh, that goes through different countries, eh? Uh, it's very important to respect, you know, the uh, culture and history of all the, you know, uh, communities where this resource passes through, because they, it is the way they benefit from it. Not, not almost the same as the way other uh, other communities use. I want to give an example. For example, how Uganda uses the Nile is not the way how Ethiopia or Egypt uses uh, uh, use the Nile. I mean, so then it's very important to respect their cultures and how they benefit from the Nile. Uh, benefits versus competing for the water, journalists must focus on benefits, not competition. Uh, you, for example, can say, uh, are these awards around these stories, around water competition, you know, stuff like that? Are they, are they, are these wars there? Where are they fought? And someone will tell you this, these wars are fought in the, me in the media. In the newspapers, on TV, that's where the wars are fought, you know, competition for water. And then if, for example, we don't uh, focus on competition, but we focus, focus on benefits, uh, this way we tell good stories eh? yeah, that promote shared narratives. Eh? Uh, it's important to find better ways to present uh, your information in the safest way, not to harm sources, especially diplomats. If you harm a diplomat, he will not give you information. These you know, transboundary resources, you must talk to diplomats because they're the ones who take decisions for the management of these uh, water bodies. Eh? Uh, speculative stories, you know, politicians, diplomats, versus evidence based stories, um, like sourcing, you know, data experts, and you know, stuff like that. It's very important for us uh, to do evidence based stories. Eh? Must source, you know, use data talk to experts, talk to scientists, take photos. And uh, yeah, so then, then this way, you kind of defamiliarize the story and bring it in a different way that uh, your audience will read, but also you'll be giving evidence. Someone will tell you uh, their stories, for example, around uh, Ethiopian Dam and people will question, but if, for example, you bring evidence, evidence around, uh, around the dam or any other, you know, uh, infrastructures being constructed on the Nile. I mean, then to be look like he, you you have a good story, you know, evidence based story, not just hearsay. Uh, question official statements. Uh, I just want to give an example. I brought this one because I wanted to tell you that most of the social media accounts you see online, some of them are not for those you think they are. For they are for some of them you may find they are for spies, you know, hiding under there. And if you don't question these official statements, you find it is a statement from someone who is not uh, the one who gave it. Eh? Talk to credible and impartial sources. You know, for example, if you are working on a story about uh, the Nile, why not talk about talk to Nile Basin Initiative? Yeah, yeah. So it's very important to do that. Eh? Uh, my last slide is uh, around uh, um, the platform. Like we started uh, recently called Nile Well, that brings together journalists and scientists. We, uh, um, we started this platform to make sure that uh, scientists, like I told you, scientists and journalists are not, not, not working together, as you would say. Um, there's a big you know, trust gap. So we want to kind of kill that gap and bring them together. So journalists and uh, scientists now can, can uh, register and be members of this uh, platform. So here, you can browse our network for active uh, journalists or scientists who are members. You can connect, you can collaborate, you can find research. And uh, again, there are other opportunities like training and you know, you know, production, you know, grants. We believe that 
when we bring journalists and science together, uh, then we do, we have journalists writing story-based, I mean, fact-based stories. Uh, yeah, so then that can inform the decision makers to take uh, right decisions. Uh, yeah, then also, and uh, like which can inform the communities to, you know, uh, know what to do. Yeah, and to work. yeah that, this is my last slide. Uh, if I still have a few minutes, I will show you one of the projects uh, we worked on. Um, yeah, thanks to share. Okay. Yeah. So this is, um, I'll take you through this one. Um, this is um, uh, a story we worked on with the, about 15 journalists from, the, uh, from East Africa. And we investigated, wanted to look at the lakes in the region, and, you know, uh, issues around the lakes, especially, you know, uh, as most of these lakes, we learned that they were shrinking. Yeah? So then we gave out grants to journalists in the region to investigate and uh, come up with different stories. Eh? So these stories were published in local media houses. We looked at the uh, lakes in Tanzania, uh, in uh, Kenya, Uganda, in Rwanda. Uh, so general, we gave uh, grants to journalists who, who, who published these stories in their local media houses. And at the end, we brought these stories together. Uh, you can see like uh, Lake Albert, uh, one of the lakes we worked on in Uganda. Yeah. Um, right. Yeah. But, thank you. Mm, thank you, Fred. Yeah, we don't have time, time for any questions. Uh, we don't have very many minutes uh, before we welcome mm. our next speaker. Uh, mm. But we have a question from Justina here, and I was thinking about the same thing. How can journalists join your network? Uh, it is easy because it is not a... Uh, you don't need to pay anything. You only register and you know become a member of our network. Uh, when you register, we take on your details and we uh, link with you. Uh, yeah, but when we are giving out grants, what I want to make sure uh, uh, to make clear is that when you are giving out grants, it's not that we give to network members. We send out a call for applications and you know generally supply, and then we pick those who we give grants not just because they are members of a network. Right. Um, and, and just one more question before we let yeah. Nadia take the floor. I wanted to know, are there any journalist networks like this dealing with water and environment uh, that are global networks that you know of? Uh, no. Uh, what I know in Africa, we have different networks, for example, who are partners for Water Journalists Africa. We have different networks in West Africa, in South Africa, but all are partners of Infonile, but of Nile Water Giants Africa. But uh, I don't know some others. Yeah, maybe, yeah, not, maybe not, that's not a good idea. To work for... on the, yeah, not several to work on the continental level, but there are, there are that work on regional level. Right. And maybe it's yeah. a good idea for, for our journalist uh, colleagues out there to start water journalist networks in other places. Yeah. Frederick, can you please share the link for registration uh, in the chat, if you can please share okay. that? Okay, I'll find it. Uh, you can actually find it on uh, our website. Yeah, um, it's just easier if you just share it on the chat, then everyone has it um, that's, that's as we right. speak. And while you're doing that, I will thank you very much for joining us here today. Uh, talking about collaboration instead of going it all alone. I yeah. think much can be gained from that. And um, our last speaker of the day is Nadia El Awadi, freelance uh, science journalist, chief editor of Nature Middle East, and also senior writer with Asia Research News. Welcome to the World Water Week Communications Initiative, Nadia. And Thank you for having me. Thanks. We've been talking a lot about research today, complicated issues, and I think it's it's a very good thing that you are going to round off with uh, talking more about how to assess the relevance of research uh, studies and give us some advice how to, to speak to scientists, interpret their, their research, and how we're going to get through all that complicated data. 
So thanks again, Nadia, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'll just share my screen as well. There. So um, hopefully that's that's working on your screens. Um, so I am Nadia Alawadi. I'm from Egypt. I'm currently based in the United Kingdom. Um, and um, I am a freelance journalist. Um, currently, a very large proportion of the journalism and science writing that I do is related to research specifically. And so I'll be talking today about how to report on scientific research. Um, a very long time ago, I won an international award for a feature story I wrote, which is this one right here. Um, on how the agricultural canal system in Egypt, and that's the system of canals that gets its water from and then drains back into the Nile River. Um, and so my report was reporting on the various sources of pollution into this agricultural canal system. This was so long ago um, that it was, um, First of all, it was just at the very beginning of the news boom on the internet that you find news stories on the internet. Uh, Facebook and Twitter were not a thing at the time. Um, and um, the organization that I published the story on um, no longer exists. And the organization that gave me the international award doesn't either. It, it, it's rebranded completely into a different organization. Um, but I mentioned this article because it represents, I think, an important type of journalism. It was, it was this sort of investigative piece. And I was, as a journalist, I spent many days on the ground um, uh, following trucks around to see who was dumping raw sewage into these agricultural canals. And also speaking with um, managers of factories who were dumping uh, the, the uh, uh, industrial dyes that they had um, in these factories into the agricultural canals. And the piece was good enough that the BBC came uh, to Egypt. They sent a producer to Egypt to produce a documentary series, basically retracing the steps that I made in order to produce this story and to make a documentary series about it. Um, this kind of reporting is a kind of reporting that journalists are quite familiar with. We're on the ground, we're gathering evidence, we're speaking with people. We're contacting sources, and sometimes maybe we even stir up a bit of a fuss. With this um, particular story, I ended up getting called into um, Egypt's National Security Police for a little chat. Um, but this is not the only way that we can report on water or on climate or on science-related issues. And we, the journalists, are not the only people who are gathering evidence. Scientists also gather evidence, and they are doing this with a much more sustained, systematic, and methodological approach. Um, they gather evidence over time according to precise scientific guidelines, and then they share their findings, but not before their strict revision of the work that they do by other experts in their field. And this research that the scientists are producing is worthy of our reporting as journalists. If um, some of you might be um, aware of Google Scholar, and that is a, it's a search engine for scholarly literature. Um, if I put in the words Nile pollution in Egypt into the search engine and then filter it for studies that were published since 2021 here, um, I'll get a list of relatively recent studies. You can see a list here. I, I did this search a, a few days ago. Um, but you'll get a, um, a list of studies that are relatively recently published that have those keywords in them. And that list can give me an idea of who's doing research in this area, what kind of research they're doing, and what their main findings are. Um, it's a great way also to find experts in, in this particular field that I'm, that I'm talking about. Um, the scientists researching pollution in the River Nile could be great sources for a story like the one that I did a few years ago. Um, I had done some of the legwork and saw what was being done, dumped into the agricultural canals and the scientists 
have data on what kinds of chemicals are found in those waters. It was really interesting listening to Bethany today that we don't even know. I mean, no, even the chemicals that the scientists might be aware of, there are lots and lots and lots of chemicals that we're not aware of. But the, the, we do have data on some things, on some of those chemicals um, that are found in the waters of the Nile and the agricultural canals and how they're impacting the ecosystem and human health. Um, so this is an important part of the water story in Egypt as an example that journalists should not neglect. Um, as I said, in recent years, um, the major portion of my work now has been dedicated to covering research studies. Um, and that has opened up a whole new and very exciting world for me. Um, every day I get to read a study that is just about to be published on topics that are as wide ranging as photonics and oceanography and quantum physics and genetics and climate change. Um, an example, I get so excited about, about research, I have to admit. And this morning I was doing an interview with a scientist to, to kind of portray my excitement and how exciting scientific research actually can be. Um, I was speaking to a researcher in Australia this morning about studies that she's doing on the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic on the mental health um, and stress levels of pregnant women. And they're doing surveys on pregnant women and then follow-up surveys on their children um, afterwards and trying to find associations between the stress that pregnant women might have experienced during the lockdowns and the development of their children. Um, in the future. And so it gets into the epigenetics of, you know, what happens within the mother's body and how that impacts as well um, ch child development. And so, I mean, there's absolutely fascinating information that you can get from speaking to researchers and reading their studies. Um, my work often involves, well, it always involves actually deciphering the very technical language of academic scientists. It's, 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 it's often very, very difficult to understand when you look at a research study. Um, but my work takes that technical academic language and translate it, translates it into something that the general public can understand. Well, I have to understand it first, don't I? Um, so I have to figure out how to understand it and then translate it to the general audience. And um, I've learned that to do this properly, I need to fit the single study that I'm reporting on into a broader context. So let me get back into my slide. And so um, questions that we need to ask are, why, why is this information that I find in a study, why is it important to a general reader? So when I'm reading a study, that's something I need to kind of figure out. And are there implications for these findings? And I need to emphasize all the time that when I'm looking at a study, that is all that it is. It is a study. And we always need to understand that science is a cumulative process and that science builds upon science and studies build upon um, studies. And so what are the implications for the findings in this particular study? And how significant are the findings in this one study? And how do these findings fit into the larger science picture? Is the research sample small or is it large? Um, can the findings be generalized? Are there studies on this same topic that have reported different results and why. And so these are, always, these are all questions that I need to always keep in mind when I'm reading a research study. So today what I want to do is to give you a few pointers on how to report on research studies. It involves getting into the technical language of science, as I said. So it's not an easy type of journalism to do, but it's a really, really important one. If you know how to access and get the gist of a research study, you'll be in a better position to weigh up understand and communicate the evidence on many of these science related and water related stories that you are reporting on. You will also be better equipped to address misinformation and recognize false news. What does the science actually say? And where do you go to find out what the science says? So first, there are many different kinds of research going on that are related to water. Um, I went through a couple of the um, uh, journals, scientific journals that publish 
water related research. And I just kind of randomly um, picked out some of the fields that these journals publish research on. And as you can see, just from these examples, it's just a wide, absolutely wide range of, of different kinds of, um, of research in, in related to water. So it, things like water quality and, and pollution, desalination, um, energy, the, 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 the links between water and energy and agriculture and public health, um, water governance, uh, you've got fresh water and you've got marine water and you've got coastal waters. And you, I mean, it's just, it's a, an absolutely huge field of science. And, um, and just by looking at these examples of fields, you can see how many different kinds of water related stories that we as journalists could be reporting on. Um, one thing you might want to consider is finding out if there are researchers in your country doing something interesting in any of these fields. And maybe they aren't. And, and that's a question that you should be asking. Why aren't they? Um, so what I want to get into next is what is a scientific journal and how do you assess its credibility? So the process of science is that once a scientist has finished an investigation and they've gathered their findings, they need to report them. And they do this by writing a paper that is always written with a very expected format. And I'll be getting into that format in, in just a bit, but it's really important that scientists report their findings. Science, as I said, is a cumulative process. One bit of evidence builds on the other until collectively we gather a more comprehensive picture of something. Um, another important thing about research is that it needs to be replicable. Um, and this makes the data more reliable and scientists, other scientists can test it. And what that means is that scientists need to report what they did very precisely within the study that they're publishing and with complete transparency. So scientists in their studies, they write their methodologies and their findings, and then they submit them to a research journal um, that is specialized in publishing research in that particular field. And the journal will have an editor specialized in this area of research who then makes a primary assessment of whether or, or not the research study is suitable for that particular journal. And if it is suitable, in many cases, depending on how this journal functions, the um, study will then be sent to uh, about three or four experts, uh, scientists in the field who are not related in any way to the actual study that we're talking about. Um, and, and they re review the study. And this is what is called the peer review process. And it's really important that as journalists that we understand what this process is about. And it works um, in different ways in different journals. Um, sometimes the, uh, the reviewers, the experts are not known. Their names are not made uh, known to the authors and vice versa. The authors' um, names are not made known sometimes to the experts. It goes both ways. Sometimes you get one, sometimes you get the other, um, sometimes you get both. Um, it differs from, um, from one journal to another. Sometimes it's completely transparent. Um, but this is information that you need to understand about the, the, the publishing process. Um, the reviewers then, they provide feedback on the study. And this feedback either leads to uh, uh, the research not being published, they decide it's not, it's, it's not ready for publication for whatever reasons, um, or yes, it can be published, but changes need to be made it, within the study in order for it to be able to be published within this journal. Um, so one thing as a journalist that's really important is that I need to be able to assess the credibility of a research study, because I mean, as I said, there are so many different kinds of journals out there and the journals and the research are not always um, as cre credible um, as we would like them to be. And so it's important for me to be able to assess a journal and a study's credibility. Um, and this begins with the journal it's published in, as I said, and, and there are many journals in every science uh, field um, from the very local. So sometimes there are like local hepatology associations that have a journal. 
Um, and these are just, a, you know, a number of, of, of specialists in a field in a country within a university or something, and then they publish their own journal. And then you've got the, to the other end of things, you've got the really esteemed nature um, and science journals, which are uh, huge organizations with a large number of journals each. Um, uh, one is based in the United Kingdom and the other is based mainly in um, the United States. And so some of the questions you need to ask are what is the journal's reputation, the journal in which the study that you're reporting on um, is published in. Is the journal prestigious in the field? Usually the scientists will be able to tell you if it's a prestigious journal in that particular field of research. Um, you wanna find out what the journal's impact factor is. And that's a number given to a journal based on the number of times its studies are cited in the references of other studies. And usually the, um, the uh, higher the impact factor, factor of a journal, the more esteemed it is. Um, it's not a perfect system, but it's a good way for someone like you and I, who aren't specialized in these fields, um, to be able to assess the credibility of a journal. And also it's important to, to ask, uh, find out whether a journal is peer reviewed. Um, you wanna also, when you're looking at the study, look at who the authors are and where they're based, which institutions they work within. Um, you wanna find out who funded the research because that can often be relevant. And are there any conflicts of interest? And um, as I said before, earlier on, what is the sample size and how representative is it? And these are just examples. Um, it's, it, and it's a very broad introduction to research publication. There are a lot of details in that. Um, but as you work, as you work more and more um, reporting on research, you learn more about the process and, and how to make your assessments on credibility. So where can you find scientific studies? Um, Google Scholar is a good place to start, um, but you'll soon discover that only short summaries of most studies are fully available. You can't, you can't often you, it's difficult to get hold of the full text of a study. And that's because many of the journals, um, access to these journals are through paid subscriptions. There are open access journals, but many journals you have to pay for. And then, so in order to have access to through Google Scholar, for example, it'll send you to the, the abstract of the study um, it, to have access to the full text of it. Um, in theory, you have to have a, a subscription to the journal that it's published in, but there are ways around that. And that's what I want to tell you about. So first, if you have found a scientific study that you want to see the full text of, um, you can get in touch with one of the authors who are involved in the study and ask if they can give you the full text because sometimes they can do that. Um, also, most journals will have their own communications team. So if you go to the journal media contact and ask them for a specific study, um, they'll actually be quite um, uh, open to that because they want journalists to report on the research studies that they're publishing in their journals. Um, many journals also welcome journalists onto their email lists. And so you can get press releases about the studies um, that have just come out. Universities and research institutions often do the same. Um, some journals will give journalists access to embargoed studies. Embargoed studies, it's a study before it has been published. So it's not yet been published, but it's planned to be published in a certain journal within the next two, three days usually. Um, and then sometimes as a journalist, you can have access to it before it's published. It's under embargo, which means that you're not allowed to share the study. You're not allowed to publish a new story about it, but you're allowed to have access to it in order to prepare your new story so that when the study gets published, that you can then publish your new story. You've had time to prepare for it. And so you can put your new story online at the same time as the, um, as the uh, study has gone online. Um, and then there are also news wire services that do something similar in, in, in terms of you, you subscribe to these newswire services and then they'll give you access to um, uh, uh, studies and to press releases on studies. And uh, what I wanted to do is show you an example of one of these because it's a really good service um, to subscribe to. You have to, in order to subscribe to it, you have to prove that you're a journalist. Am I not showing? Is this not showing on the screen? It is, yes. Um, so you. This is Eureka Alert. It's one example of a few serv such services. And I'm signed into my account here. And you can see um, by going through here that it shows you 
studies or press releases on studies that are embargoed. This one is embargoed until the 1st of July. And if I click on that, just as an example, it will send me, oops, I have to re-sign in. It'll give me the press release. It tells me the embargo, the date that this, stu this study will be released. Um, it gives me access to multimedia material that I can use with my um, uh, news story. And then at the bottom of the press release, usually, not always, but usually it'll give you, and here it does, it'll give you access to the actual study right there. Um, uh, it's two studies in this case that you can then click on, you can read the studies, get details. Um, it also, some, the Eureka Alert gives you on this side here, it gives you um, media contacts that you can get in touch with. And then the other really cool thing, um, I know we're short on time right now, so I'm just gonna quick, quickly go through this part. But the other really cool thing about something like Eureka Alert, and I use this every single day, is that it, if I click on that, it'll give me access to the studies that will be published in Science Magazine, um, with the, the journal Science, I'm sorry, um, before they actually get published. And one of the really, really cool things that I'm always using this is find local authors. It'll show me where the authors in the public, the issue that's going to be coming out tomorrow, for example, where they're all from in, in all of the studies that are published in that specific issue. And so, as someone who uh, much of the work that I do is related to, it's either related to the Arab region or to Asia, I'm looking, I'm always looking for research studies that are published by scientists that are based in certain parts of the world. And so this is very helpful. So this will show me, let's pretend here that I'm, I'm from Beijing. I'm a journalist in, based in Beijing. It shows me here that this is an article that's going to be published today, six, no, tomorrow on the 16th of June on this particular topic. And I can download this study and then start reporting on it and having my news story ready for, for when that study actually gets published. And so it's a really, really, really useful um, um, uh, service to subscribe to. Um, the uh, last thing that I want to show you is an example of an actual study. Um, and, and the structure, the format of, of a typical study. And it's always, it's always quite, it's very similar um, the, how, how research studies are formatted um, from one study to another. And so there's always you know, the, the typical title um, and that'll give you the, an idea of what the study is about. Um, you've got your abstract that will also show you, um, it gives you a summary, excuse me. It'll give you a summary of, Sorry, a summary of um, of the study. The abstracts are often very technical, not always, but often. And um, it might give you the gist of what the study is about, but it also might be difficult enough that you don't get the gist of the study there either. And so the way that I go about it is if I don't get the gist of a study, I know that I'll get, if I go into the introduction, in most cases, if it's a good journal, the introduction will give me a good idea of why this field of research is important. Um, it'll provide some context. It'll give me um, a, an idea of, you know, why, how can I link this to, to the audience that I'm writing for? Um, and, and so the introduction is always really, really important. Um, here on the side, um, you'll see that it shows information on funding and competing interests. That's, of course, that's, that's ex extremely important. You get your list of authors up here and what institutions they belong to. Um, the person to get in touch with, the research, in order to choose who to get in touch with to talk to about the research, it's usually the best way to start is to go to the corresponding author. And that's the study author who was designated by that research group to be the contact person for anybody who wants to understand something about the study. And so in this case, it's this person, uh, Nicolas uh, Mouquet, or Mouquet um, who's based in France, and they give his email address. And again, it's another, that's another great way to find um, the contacts of researchers generally. Find, even if you just go into Google Scholar and you only have access to the abstracts, 
if you're looking for a research field, look through Google Scholar, look for somebody's name in particular, look for the research studies that they've published, and you might find their email address inside that um, research study. I, I, I resort to that often if I can't find a researcher's contacts on their university website. Um, so going through the format really, really quickly, um, it, they then go on to report their results in detail. Um, at the end of the study, they'll report on the methodology in precise detail, exactly how they went through um, their research process. Um, and then you've got a discussion and a conclusion that summarizes the research findings, their implications, and why it's all important. So that's, that's really brief. I'm, I'm, I'm already past uh, the time that I have available, but I'll, I'll end with just that last slide with just some final tips of advice, um, which I think are really important. And that is, to, and I've already said this, but make it clear that what you're reporting on, if, if you're reporting on only one study, that that is what it is, it's just one study. Um, and don't sensationalize, um, don't use words like, uh, first discovery, breakthrough, largest, you'll find sometimes that even the scientists resort to using these words. Um, if you can't, as a journalist, independently verify that that's true, that it is a breakthrough, that it is a discovery, that it is the first, if you can't independently verify that, I would definitely advise um, that you don't use those words. And um, it's, I, again, as I said, it's, this is a, it's a really, really uh, brief, um, overview of what you can do with research studies. Um, and it's an absolutely fascinating area of journalism to work in if, you, if you're so lucky to do that. Um, and um, looking forward to um, any questions that you might have. Thank you, now I muted myself. Thank you very, very much, Nadia. Very good tools, ideas, tips. Uh, do you mind sharing uh, the address for that um, very informative uh, page that you were talking about. I can see uh, Cecil is writing. Are you sharing, Cecil? No? About uh, the um, Eureka alert. Yes, Eureka. Yes. It's in the power. It, I, it's I, in the PowerPoint. It, okay, it, 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 and I, I will share the PowerPoint with with everyone, so you will get it there. Um, it's just so that we don't forget about it. Um, if we have any questions coming in on the chat, just type away, please. I was wondering, um, when you do your, when, when you read like a, a study and then you, if I may say, translate that in, into an article, do you ever let researchers read the story that you've written for fact checks or, or do, you, do they want to, or do they contact you afterwards? How do you go about that? It, it, it varies. So it depends on, it. it so it depends on who you're writing for. Um, some media organizations have a policy that they can't be checked. Other media organizations will say that they have to be checked. Um, it, it depends on the story. I think it depends on, uh, it, there are many different factors. It, I think from my personal experience that the, it's important that the scientific accuracy of my reporting is checked by the person who actually knows the science. Um, and so I'll sometimes send parts of an article to the scientist. Can you please just check through this and make sure that I got this right? Because in the end, I'm responsible. I send or what I you know publish for my readers. And I need to make sure that the facts are right. And because I'm not specialized in these fields, I can't always be sure. And so it's important that I speak with the scientists and make sure that they verify these facts. Um, the other thing that we can do, and, and I, I always recommend, is that you get an independent researcher to comment on the study um, that you're reporting on. Um, again, because I'm not specialized in the area. And so it's difficult for me to assess the significance of certain findings. And so if I go to somebody who wasn't involved in the study, but is involved in that research area and ask them, could you, would you, would you mind taking a look at this study and letting me know, what do you think? Do you have any quotes to send me? Do you, can you, can you tell me something about the methodology? Or, it, or what are the implications of this study and how does it fit into this larger picture? 
Um, and so, yeah, it all depends on, it, there are certain factors um, involved that, that, that in the end make one decide what gets sent to a scientist um, before a, a publication of a new story on their research. All right, thank you. Uh, last week, we had a presenter speaking about uh, fake news, misinformation, disinformation. You touched on it briefly. Do you see more fake research uh, or misleading research today? And how do we uh, guard ourselves from, from not republishing something that isn't uh, correct? Yeah. Um, well, the way that you guard yourself against it is, is through the advice that I gave about um, how do you assess the credibility of a research study and of the journal that it's published in. Um, I mean, there is no journal that is completely safe, 100% safe from publishing something, you know, that has misinformation in it. Um, but you, you sort of do protect yourself as a journalist by reporting on the more on, this, on the research that's published in the more credible journals. And so that, I think that's, that's the most important way to go about it. Um, the good thing about the credible journals is that um, if, something, if something in a research study turns out to be wrong for any reason, these journals then go and they'll let you know. They, they'll, they'll publish corrections, they'll publish changes, they'll remove, they'll retract um, studies from, from the journals. And so, so it, you protect yourself as a journalist by by making sure that the, the reporting that you're doing is on credible research and is is on from credible uh, that's that's published in credible journals. Um, yeah, I mean, of course, there are um, and there's a lot of stuff happening, um, especially since COVID, that um, you have the preprints, um, which are it, it's it's now a, a becoming more acceptable for scientists to publish their research on open search engines um, uh, before their research has been um, reviewed by experts in the field or published in journals. And we'll, uh, journalists who want to can access those and can report on them. But that's a really, I think for me, it's a, that's a really iffy area. So I haven't, I've never reported on, uh, on a preprint. Um, it might be interesting for me to, to look at a preprint and to you know, get an idea of you know what's happening in that field, just to, to be on top of things, but I haven't reported on them. But um, yeah, so it's it, it's a difficult area. It yeah, is, but, it, but there there are ways, um, as you say, to to try and, and stay protected from them. We have some thank you in the chat. Uh, normal questions. We're also running out of time. Thank you so much, Nadia. I will share uh, Nadia's presentation with all of you, so you get that. Um, those interesting links that you can that can be useful for you in the future. Uh, thank you for coming to the program.